Well, let me say that I'm a, I'm a fan. I did not know about your podcast until about a month ago when an incoming student at Vanderbilt Divinity School, where I teach, uh, sent me an email and asked me if I knew about your podcast. And it was merely a week later that I suffered a detached retina and had to spend a week face down, uh, unable to read or do anything that I normally would be doing. So I listened to podcasts. I, I think I've listened to probably three fourths of your episodes at this point. <laughs> and uh, you helped me get uh, into my healing process that That's week. That's good. So I, I just fell in love with both of you at first hearing, and <laughs> I appreciate what you're doing and I'm supporting you financially as well as uh, spiritually in your efforts. And I think psychotherapy is not in a wonderful place today in the United no. States. No. And, um, and, uh, and I as uh, appreciate you from that perspective as well. I think we have a lot of work to do mm. in uh, our so-called behavioral health community. Yeah. Mm. Well, we are really delighted that you've joined us because since you discovered us, we had the chance to discover you and the the voice of the moral Christian left is muffled by the drowned voices of the fascistic right. And so yes. you are a very welcome guest in terms of giving us another perspective on Christianity in its truly spiritual, positive way. So I'm really glad you're here. Thank you. I, I hope I can represent that well, or at least part of that well. Well, the from Christian your left, writing, or, yeah. From your writing, you represent it very well. Thank you, Harriet. And Bruce, I want to say, as somebody who was raised by uh, evangelical esque Christian, mm -hmm. uh, sort of right wing esque people. Um, I appreciate you. And um, that was, maybe we'll get into this and maybe not, but that was a huge struggle for me growing up. I didn't realize mm -hmm. till later it was a huge struggle. And mm -hmm. so even having discovered a such thing as a sort of Christian left in the last maybe five years of my life was extraordinarily healing and eye-opening mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. So discovering your work that you are, you're one of those Christians and you're a psychotherapist and you have this kind of anti-capitalist analysis for me was really refreshing and exciting. Mm -hmm. So it, for me, it's an honor to have you on the podcast as well. Well, and Max, hearing you say that, I, I especially am grateful for your willingness for me to be on the podcast <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know, religious trauma is a real thing. And I've over mm. the years seen quite a number Snaps. of patients. Yeah. Mm. Who have suffered um, a, a kind of religious trauma. I yes, think that's that's what I would call it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've had several clients who have um, sort of fluctuated in their emotions to the point where they're given diagnoses, but they're just used to being everything. Either you are moral or you are going to hell. They're right. used to growing up with a, a truly diametrically opposed set of rules and and laws that encourage them to be quite extreme in their feelings and emotions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and I must say, since you come from one place, I come from a different place in your um, writings, Bruce, you talk about how you were from a Baptist, no, not a Baptist, but a, a church community that was more like a commune and socialistic mm -hmm. in its inclusion. And I, my father had been a communist in the 30s and was a deeply spiritual person, although against organized religion because of mm -hmm. his sense that it restricted people. But I did get a sense of hope, a sense of belief, a sense of the possibility of doing it together, which is a spiritual experience. Yes, the, the small communities and I grew up in Southern Appalachia, um, near, near and around Fort Payne, Alabama, just below Chattanooga, Tennessee. And so, uh, Appalachia was, is still deep in my bones. 
And I, I don't think the uh, communities I grew up in would have recognized themselves under, under the term socialism, but nonetheless, uh, they essentially did live as cooperatives, mm. you know, as, uh, as communes almost. So um, when, when one suffered, all suffered. And they very much acted in a spirit of solidarity, both those who were churchgoers and those who weren't. Mm. Uh, you know, who lived in the area. So um, I gave a series of talks not many years ago here in Nashville to a prominent um, Christian congregation for two consecutive Wednesday nights. And the, uh, the title, as I recall, was Capitalism, Is Capitalism Making Us Sick, Selfish, and Anti-Religious? Mm. And at the end of the series, uh, a gentleman in his 70s raised his hand and he said, where did, where did you get started on this line of thinking? He said, did you read a lot of Marx in college? <laughs> and I paused and I said, and this was true at the time, I said to him, in fact, I haven't read a single word of Marx. And I said, I got started on this track because first, I grew up in Southern Appalachia among rural sustenance farmers and uh, mechanics and laborers. And I learned from experience the importance of belonging mm -hmm. and that only when we belong to community do we come to know who we are as individuals in a healthy way. And I said, I learned there that there was something deeply wrong with capitalism and its centering of finance as, you know, the core of human existence. And I said, uh, the second thing that led me down this road was um, the Bible <laughs> and his eyes got wide. Um, mm -hmm. And I said, there's no way you can read the Hebrew Bible or the Christian gospels and not feel for working people and the poor and to, to make uh, love and compassion and kindness the focus of your life and to put um, human connection first, you know, above profit. And, you know, he seemed to be able to hear that. So, it's in interactions like that, Herod, I was talking with you earlier about having hope. I think people, if they can hear you, you know, that you're not some wild haired, well, sometimes I am, but <laughs> you're not some wild haired, uh, radical in the, in the destructive sense of that word, mm -hmm. um, but that you really do care. So yeah, I'll yeah. get off that high horse. Well, I think it's, it is important because the Christian right is so much in the spotlight that our audience and Max and I really do need to hear more about the radical Christian left that you represent, where it is, what it is, why it isn't as strong as the right, all of those things. Yeah, maybe we should say a few words about uh, why the Christian right is so prominent Yes. Uh, not only numerically, but in, in the media and its media exposure. I have mm -hmm. here on my desk, because I knew this, that we'd need to talk about this, a copy of William Connolly's book, uh, Capitalism and Christianity American Style. Mm -hmm. uh, this came out in 08. And he teaches at Johns Hopkins and uh, is a political scientist. Uh, and he has a chapter on what he calls the evangelical capitalist resonance machine. Now he's talking about the U S context, uh, but get these couple of sentences. For example, he says the right leg of the evangelical movement today is joined at the hip to the left leg of the capitalist juggernaut. Hmm. Neither leg could hop far unless it was joined to the other. So I think my short answer to why we constantly hear about um, the religious right is that it serves the purposes of the elites. Mm -hmm. So even if the elites 
don't have any religious commitments themselves, that doesn't matter. They realize that um, they need the religious right in order to accomplish their political goals. And so the media is constantly uh, shining a, a bright light on the religious right. There are far more people, I think, on the religious left than people would assume. Yeah. Frankly. They just don't get the same media exposure, unfortunately. I mean, we do have, uh, some people are aware of William Barber's Poor People's Campaign, which Harriet and I were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. But as I was saying to Harriet, there are even um, social justice movements and organizations among evangelicals. Mm -hmm. uh, these are not evangelicals who support Trump, and most of them, uh, Max, are around your age. Mm -hmm. So these are, I guess we'd say, millennials who, are, mm -hmm. who happen to be evangelicals who have been turned off by the church. So many of them have left the churches in which they grew up but they still claim to be evangelical Christians. Hmm. Some of them have formed uh, organizations um, to work against climate change. Uh, others have formed organizations to work against racism, patriarchy, and these are evangelical Christians. You wouldn't know from the media that these, this even existed. No, you wouldn't. But hmm. I guess every fascist movement needs a proletarian base to be its brown shirts and the Christian right is the proletarian base for Trump's elitist um, coterie. Yes, yes. Years ago, I discovered the Unitarians. I did not know that they existed. And I, I think, you know, some Christians consider Unitarians sort of like not real, like not Christians, not like real religious people. They're just sort of these like hippies or something like that's the impression I got over time like um I don't know um kind sort of white liberal people or something mm -hmm. and they just are like we want to go to a place that feels like church but we're, we swear it's not church or whatever um but from some uh like a sort of activist campaign years ago I was involved in we kind of found as we were trying to organize the faith community around it was like a fossil fuel divestment um like divesting from the banks invested in Dakota Access Pipeline we found that the Unitarians and a handful of Christian leftists, I mean, evangelical Christian leftists, even here in Santa Barbara, were like super on board to mm -hmm. go, you know, talk with the mayor. And like, you know, so I sort of found to my surprise how much it's like they're around. It actually seems like they've been around or you guys have been around mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. organizing uh, just when we consider organizing, you know, whether it's labor or anti-racism or like whatever kind of leftist project you want to choose from it seems like the christian left has been there all along from what i understand now but i think it seems like from what you're saying bruce <clears throat> at some point and my understanding is maybe somewhere around the 80s like reagan era somehow like the christian right got really funded and like got a bunch of yes. big lit up microphones or something like i don't know the mm -hmm. details but yes. like Yes. that kind of changed the trajectory, right? So suddenly they became what Christianity mm -hmm. is now popularly considered mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, liberals will, and if you look at even, you know, MSNBC, Rachel Maddow, whatever, Chris Hayes, people like they'll, you'll see these like sort of well-meaning liberals make these snarky jokes about the stupid Christians and stuff, sort of mm -hmm. conflating Christianity mm -hmm. as a whole now with this sort of right-wing conservative movement so again, to my surprise, like getting swept up in that and being raised by people who I think honestly were indoctrinated into that around the time that I was born, frankly, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, finding that, okay, there's actually been a bit of a suppressed history here where mm -hmm. um, there, there always had, it seems like there's always has been a Christian left that shares the values of say socialists, mm -hmm. anarchists, communists, you know, the traditional milieu of leftism. So yeah, I would like to say a word about that, but first let me touch on the mm -hmm. point you made about 1980 and what changed. So mm -hmm. I was born in 1956, and I grew up among um, evangelical Christians, Southern Baptists, um, and, uh, and in the countryside, there were basically Southern Baptist churches. We didn't call them Southern Baptists. They were usually called Missionary Baptists. Mm -hmm. uh, then there was called Primitive Baptists, who were the more Calvinist variety. 
Uh, there were Pentecostals, Churches of God, a few Methodist churches. That was about it. But by and large, these Christians who most would say had a fundamentalist kind of theology were not politically active, not, not as religious people. Um, they kind of considered politics to be a dirty game and they wanted to stay out of it. And this did not happen until the neoliberal revolution occurred. And when the neoliberal revolution occurred, Max, you're quite right. Lots of money flowed from the coffers of uh, the right, the neoliberal movement into what we now know, now would call the religious right. And they become prominent in the way we know them today and, and pretty much along single issues lines, single issue lines like abortion, for example. Mm. But going back to your other point, I mean, the Christian left has a very old history in the United States and uh, we could only conjure up the term social gospel, for example, which was a huge movement mm -hmm. in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s. Um, they may not have called themselves Marxists, but they knew the works of Marx and they weren't ashamed to use uh, Marxist analysis uh, with regard to the culture. And they weren't exclusively white either. For some time in theological uh, institutions, the social gospel movement was stereotyped as a white movement. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary Dorian wrote a book not too long ago, a, an award-winning book on the black social gospel mm -hmm. that showed that this was not, this was not cut along lines of race. Uh, the social gospel movement in the Christian churches was, was across races and, um, and it, and it took sides in class conflict and it called it that hmm. it called it class conflict and that they were on the side uh, of working people. Um, they joined up with what eventually became union movements on the side of labor. Even then, there was a schism within Christian churches, uh, obviously, between churches that were owned and operated by the elites and churches that wanted to support working people. Um, so, and, and I would say, as a theologian, uh, they had the writings of the New Testament and the Hebrew Bible on their side because it's mm -hmm. not difficult to find plenty of support in the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament for the care of the poor and what uh, liberation theologians in Latin America began to call uh, God's preferential option for the poor. Um, and this is a history that many people in the United States just have no awareness of. Yeah, that's true. I would hope that the radical Christian left would get its point of view recognized in the left press like Portside or Alternet or the Truth Out and those things so that people could understand that it's a powerful current in the United States and a, an important one. I hope so too, Harriet. There, there are some signs that that could be happening. Um, I would add though that the situation is very complex because um, liberal white Christianity has been embarrassed by the Christian right. Yes. But what they share with the Christian right is they support the neoliberal status quo. Mm -hmm. So um, Chris Hedges, whom we mentioned earlier, um, has been very outspoken as a Presbyterian about the failures of white liberal ch Christian churches, you know, to yeah. speak out against the religious right. Mm -hmm. And the reason they haven't, by and large, is they still are captured by uh, the utopianism of neoliberalism. So I think it's, I really take um, some offense at people who only say it's evangelicals that are the problem, when uh, white liberal churches are part of the problem as well. Yeah, well, that I... Go ahead, Max. I was going to say, uh, you know, I also recently realized that so 
this term, the black church, right? Like there's this Mm -hmm. history of the black church throughout the history of the U S which seems like it's kind of a complex term and complex history in and of itself. I think um, I I also didn't quite realize like, so when we talk about the Christian left, for example, I think sometimes there's a sort of implied thing that the left well, I don't know. It, the left, the left is white. Like, like is the is the black church considered part of the Christian left? Right. So these are mm-hmm, also mm-hmm. some some complexities mixed in there. Because um, I guess my understanding of the black church historically has been a hub of community and refuge and uh, solidarity and mutual aid from like slavery times to, you know. Anyway, I'm not an expert on it, but. I wonder how also certain parts of what you're saying, like there's sort of the Christian left and there's the white liberal Christian uh, evangelical world today. And how is that so removed? Like, where did that come from? How is it so far removed from like the black Christian or evangelical uh, traditions? And I'm probably stumbling over my words because I don't know enough about this. I'm sorry, but no, if you have any right. kind of comments it, or clarifications on it, a, a bit. I mean, I would, I would not academically speaking, I wouldn't consider myself an expert, for example, on the history of the Black Church in the United States. However, I do know uh, from firsthand relationships that we often speak of the Black Church as if it's a monolith. Yeah, uh, it is right, not, right. and of so. Not. There, much of the black church are black evangelicals Mm -hmm. and a considerable number while they don't support Trump, uh, they do, uh, many of the black evangelicals do support the prosperity gospel, which is completely in line with capitalism. Mm -hmm. So while they don't support Trump because of his racism, they would not disagree with Trump's uh, support of capitalism. Mm. So everywhere we go with regard to religion, uh, right now we're talking about Christianity. We have to appreciate the multifaceted, um, ways that the hybrids that exist on the landscape. Mm. And I think the reason this is so important is that religion remains in spite of, um, prophets of secularization who mostly are in the academy and out of touch with what's going on on the ground. Um, the, the reason religion remains so prominent is that it is powerful. Mm-hmm. Religion is, a, in a sense, if you look at it from a sociological standpoint, religion has to do with the cultural imagination. What sort of ideals as a society do we want to move toward? And religion plays a critical role in forming the metaphors, the narratives, and the language, uh, and the passion for reaching toward these goals. And because of that, it tends to get used. So that's both a strength and a weakness. Uh, it, the the power it can hold to move the masses, so to speak, hmm. is easily co-opted by um, dictators, fascism, and so forth. But it, it can also be captured by liberation movements, mm-hmm. as it was during the abolition movement in the United States, hmm. and as it was in the civil rights movement again in the 60s, uh, not to mention the social gospel movement that I mentioned earlier in the early 1900s. There was a time in the early 1900s that there was a real, some would say, risk that the United States was going to move towards socialism. Mm. It was a real possibility. Mm -hmm. And uh, American Christianity was right in the middle of it. So part of why the Christian left is not visible is because it has been silenced. So the same movements that happened in the federal government of the United States in the 1940s and 50s that squelched, uh, that rooted out uh, communist members of labor unions, for example, those hearings that were held before U.S. Congress to root out communist and socialist elements from the labor movement, that same impetus rooted out those same elements from Christianity in the United States. 
that were t that that was tied together. So uh, the Christian left has been, you might say, silenced, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know if I'm comfortable using the word oppressed, but in a sense, oppressed, mm -hmm. as in denied having a voice. So that's part of why we don't hear about it. And we tend to only hear about it in uh, civil rights discourse. So we do, we do get some media exposure for uh, Reverend Barber's poor people's campaign, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then you don't hear much about young millennial white evangelicals who are supporting uh, ecological justice, do we? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It strikes me that always the missing thing is a unifying force that all the people who oppose the immoral destruction of the planet and of the lives of other people could get together under a banner of something mm -hmm. so that it would be a unified oppositional force, including religious people, spiritual people of all kinds, as well as union members and others, because there is a terrible moral depravity about the right wing and Trump, which does inspire people to want an alternative. Yes. And, you know, while I deeply hope and pray as a Christian minister that Trump loses this election, mm -hmm. Uh, because of the house of horrors that we currently find ourself, mm. ourselves in, I do not for a minute think that we're going to be rescued by the Biden-Harris ticket. No. You know, uh, this will be, in my view, uh, it will be a return to what Nancy Frazier has called progressive neoliberalism. Yes. Yes, uh, I noticed that in your writing. That was really yeah. well said. I'm very taken with her analysis of progressive neoliberalism, which which is a political alliance, she says, between um, progressives who do support uh, women's rights, uh, GLBTQ rights, um, who are against patriarchy, racism, who are for ecological justice and so forth. It is an alliance between that group and uh, the capitalist powers of Silicon Valley um, and the sort of sim symbolic structures of neoliberalism and so on. So while it goes under the name progressive, it looks at everything except uh, economic justice and class. Right. It Absolutely. leaves that out. Yeah, I think that's, with all movements, and I could certainly see it as a founding mother of the second wave women's movement, there is this struggle which still exists between having an equal place in the most grotesquely unequal society, an equal mm -hmm. access to power within that unequal society, or mm -hmm. equality for all, even all of your gender or race, which never comes with the neoliberal agenda. There's room only at the top, and the bottom right. is going to be crushed. And that gets confused in liberation struggles because people want to see representatives of their color or their sex at the top, regardless mm -hmm. of their politics. Sure. So, so it's as if we have reached the kingdom of God, so to speak, if um, everyone at the top is diverse. Yes. <laughs> you know. The like 1% Obama. is diverse. Right, exactly. And that the 99% sinks further and further into abject mm -hmm. poverty and desperation, which is what's so, happening now. I, I think my progressive friends, and as you imagine, I have lots of progressive friends in the Liberal Theological Academy mm -hmm. <laughs> that is comfortable with the Christian left and Jewish left and other left. Um, I... I I sometimes find myself ironically speaking up for folks who have voted for Trump, you know, mm -hmm. back in Appalachia and so forth, not defending the fact that they voted for Trump, 
but to say, you know, who do these people have, politically speaking, on their side? Nobody. Right. They're desperate. They're having mm-hmm. trouble paying their bills. They're having trouble having enough food, housing, health care. And they know that the Democratic Party threw them overboard 30 years ago. That's right. And what they don't know is that they're being thrown into shark-infested waters now. However, I think that, you know, I agree with you on that. And because they were abandoned and a class agenda disappeared from the Democratic rhetoric, what happens is the enemies become uppity women, black people, immigrants, rather than a system where there's only room at the top. Sure. And everyone else is is mired in misery. Now that well, we we know as psychotherapists that people who are hurting are very vulnerable for anything that will make them feel better, right? Or that pr- promises some comfort. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they're politically vulnerable to those who say, you know, it's it's not your fault. It's it's the goddamn immigrants or it's the blacks, Mm -hmm. or it's the Muslims, or it's the whoever, or it's the liberals. Mm -hmm. Um, So one thing I wrote in a recent essay on the, on the website, radicaldiscipleship.com, which is a, which is a site I do recommend to look to for some left-wing evangelical spirit. I wrote in an essay um, there, well, where was my thought going with this? Um, you were talking about why people would look to Trump because it's an it's a, at least he articulates a class agenda. Yes, well, and from the yes. psychotherapy perspective, right? Of yeah. people in vulnerable positions. Oh, from the psychotherapy being... perspective, right. yes, we we mm-hmm. we know that people who are vulnerable uh, need hope. So, what the right wing political movement now had has understood in the United States for some time, you know, your, your podcast is called, it's not just in your head. And the reason it's called that is because the dominant view in psychiatry Mm. and psychotherapy in the United States is that it is just in your head. That's right. Yep. (laughs) And the reason that's the dominant view is that it supports neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. Basically, basically it covers neoliberalism's ass. Yes, it does. From from having to take responsibility for its atrocious social ills that it causes. Well, here's what the right wing pol- political movement has right. They know that people are tired of taking responsibility for their own suffering. Mm-hmm. People are ready to believe it's not just in their own heads. Mm-hmm. So they have taken advantage of that. But instead of saying it's it's this economic global banking system, for example, Mm -hmm. and huge monopoly corporations, they're they're pointing in the wrong direction. They're pointing to women, minorities, um, immigrants, Mm -hmm. what have you, as people who have reduced our country and taken our country away from us. Well, they're ripe for that kind of message because they know in their heart that this is not just in their heads. There's something wrong they just mm-hmm. don't know what it is. Earlier, I wanted to shift into sex. I realized we're talking about like Christian left and evangelical right and all of this, this uh, neoliberalism. And then like sometimes when me and Harriet are talking, I'm like, wait, oh, yeah, we're therapists because we just get into kind of left wing stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, like from your perspective, you know, so, you know, you're on the Christian left. You consider yourself a leftist. You have this big critique of neoliberalism. And then there's the psychotherapy piece. Right. And just mm-hmm. what you just said in that psychotherapy covers neoliberalism's ass. And I would say it goes the other way, too, in that individualized psychotherapy and psychiatry based modes of healing um, were reinforced and propped up by neoliberalism to so that they are now the, the, the normative mode of healing and interventions into helping society, along with with sort of nonprofitism, which is another rant. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but how, you know, given all of this, I sometimes wonder, how did I get into this? Why did Harriet get into it? Why did you get into it? If we sort of know that psychotherapy still is ultimately, usually a bit of an individualistic intervention into the neoliberal problem, 
Yeah. How did you get into it? Why do you do it? Uh, what are your well, you know, as, thoughts and as, beliefs <laughs> on psychotherapy as it as it stands? Yeah. As as you imagine, I've been I've done a lot of soul searching about this, Max. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. In my individual story, I, I got into psychotherapy because my first intention was to become a pastor. Uh, so I felt that I was called into the ministry and to do what my father did and my grandfather before him was to be a Christian pastor. And when I got into, but, but I was from the working class and my, my, my father didn't finish high school, much less go to college or seminary. And my grandfather, I'm referring to my mother's father was an illiterate Baptist farmer preacher. Uh, his wife would read the scriptures to him and he would memorize it and then get up in the pulpit and preach, but he couldn't read the Bible. So that's, that, that was my roots. But what these churches cared deeply about was caring for people. Mm. They cared deeply about people, about individuals, not just the congregation as a whole. I, I think, so let me go from there and, and make a huge chasm leap, Max, to get directly at your question. I think we have to work very hard to distinguish individuality and individualism. Mm. Most, most religious traditions, and, and not only religious traditions, philosophical, ideological uh, narratives, uh, treasure, some would call it the infinite value of the individual. So there is, for example, in the Christian Gospels, the sayings of Jesus, such as, that God loves you so much that that very hairs on your head are numbered. Hmm. Well, that that's pretty goddamn precious, you know, about the value of the individual, but that's not identical with individualism. No. Hmm. So, uh, Jacques Derrida famously said in his, one of his last lectures as he was dying from pancreatic cancer, He made a statement that became very controversial. He said, the death of the individual is the death of the world. Mm -hmm. And that got him in trouble with a lot of social justice people. (laughs) But they took what he said out of context. What he was trying to say is um, infinite is infinite. And the individual is of infinite value, is precious. Every life is precious. But if every life is precious, so is he, so is humankind as a whole. So is the planet. Mm. We're all tied together. Yeah. So when I, when I talk about in my book, the soul, I'm not talking about uh, this popular image of the soul as some disembodied ghost that inhabits our bodies. I define soul in my book as the fabric that connects us to ourselves, to others, to the society around us, to the planet and to the eternal. And I capitalize Mm -hmm. eternal because I don't, I'm not making that exclusive to people who quote, believe in God. However, we define that. Yes. But by the eternal, I mean, whatever is of ultimate value, you know, that Mm -hmm. of transcendent value. Um, so that to me is what soul is about. And, and I think, you know, people who are identify themselves as religious, such as myself, we don't have a monopoly on soul. No, never have. I would say that all good psychotherapy attends to the soul. Yes, I think so too. And it goes etymologically, the meaning of the word psychotherapy is the healing of the soul. That's mm. what the Greek terms mean. Mm. So working for the health of individuals is not discordant with working for the health of the society in which they live. They go together. They have to go together. And if we only evaluated society in the abstract without valuing the individuals, we would end up with a herd mentality that would be very, very evil and very destructive. Hmm. So 
I think, Max, we're talking about two sides of the same coin of justice when we talk about attending to individuals and their pain mm. and attending to social ills. These go hand in hand. And in my book, I talk about my work as a, as a psychotherapist. I, I consider myself very privileged because I think when I sit with individuals in pain, they give me a window into the world, not just themselves, but a window into the world in which they live. Hmm. So I do believe in good psychotherapy. I just don't think it's, it's sufficient to save the world. <laughs> it's just one of those hmm. things we need to do to help human beings. But it, what it should not be is what neoliberal, neoliberalism turns it into, which is just to help people be feel just good enough that they don't feel the need to change anything mm -hmm. in society. Yeah. You know, I, I completely support what you say, which is very consonant with the idea of the liberation therapy movement with the individual having inside of a triangle in which one arm is the personal and another arm is the cultural and another arm is the social and political. And I see psychotherapy as a liberation possibility because you can't fight if you're demobilized yes. and you can't realize yeah. who your values are and what they are if you're demobilized as a human being, which right. a lot of people are. And mm -hmm. often just understanding that this is not an accident, that you are part of a social trend is transformative. You know, I have a client yes. who came to me because she was very depressed because she's in this marriage She's a working class woman married to a bus driver. And all he wants to do is come home, sit down, look at television, buy sneakers and trade them. And she wants more. And mm -hmm. yet she can't survive with her child without being married. She had no idea. She was completely taken by the feudal transformation of a household in which a woman is in a household owned and dominated by a man in a class sense. She is a feudal serf producing emotional values, cooked food, cleanliness, order, mm -hmm. childcare, social connection. And then when she enters the capitalist workplace, because capitalists deserted America, and then comes home and the man still wants his feudal privileges, there's mm -hmm. going to be conflict. Mm -hmm. And she had never right. seen it that way. Mm -hmm. she, you know, and... There are basic books that show that. There's a group called the Cambridge Women's Pornography Collective. And the pornography is pictures of hunky man, men vacuuming and um, <laughs> coming into their wife mm -hmm. in, the, her, in her ba bubble bath and saying, what a hard work day you had, have a Chardonnay, <laughs> and things like that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> They have calendars and things like that. Uh -huh. And it makes the point without being dogmatic. Yes. But just realizing the p class position that she was in and what she's trying to get out of and why she's in that position mm -hmm. has allowed her to bring that up to her husband and feel empowered rather than a failure at marriage on a personal level. Exactly. Exactly. So so that it's a liberation discourse in which you can combine the personal pain with the forces that create that pain mm -hmm. and liberate people from both. And individualism, that's such an important, Bruce, that's such an important differentiation between individualism in which you're the only thing that's important and the hell with connection or other people mm -hmm. and individuality in which you know your strengths, you know your soul, you know your possibilities, and you know your need for connection. There's Very a Pan-African There's a pan -African term you may have heard called Ubuntu. And yeah. Ubuntu has often been translated, I am because we are. Mm -hmm. And that very nicely ties together uh, the preciousness of individuality within community. 
The, the other, the downside of individualism, the other downside of individualism, Harriet, as I was listening to you talk is, um, you know, neoliberalism is an ideology. In fact, I would claim it is a religion or it is at least a quasi religion. You know, it, it has its own priests, bishops and so forth, especially in the banking world. It has its own heresies, the people that it throws out and won't have anything to do with. And uh, it has a, a utopian, a, a, what a theologian would call an eschatology. You know, it, it thinks if you let the market do its thing, it will save mm -hmm. everybody in the end. So it is a utopian project. It is It functions essentially as a religion. And one of its doctrines is individual responsibility. So part of individualism is if something has gone wrong, it's because some individual somewhere made a bad decision. Mm. So we have, in essence, pardon the overworn, overworn buzz term of drinking the Kool-Aid, but we've all, in a sense, drunk the Kool-Aid of individual responsibility. And we feel like if things are not going well in our life, I'm thinking about the woman you were sharing the story about. Yeah. Harriet. Uh, we all think, well, I've made a mess of my life. Mm -hmm. It's all my fault. Right. With no awareness at all of the array of powers that are arrayed against us. Mm -hmm. So in one of these uh, interview letters I wrote for Radical Discipleship, I said, it's like we're living the Hunger Games in real time. So <laughs> we're made individually responsible for our failures as well as successes but we are deprived of the resources we need to succeed. I would say that's sadistic. Yes, it is. It's a cultural form of sadism. And it's so a in denial. Yeah, mm. in psychotherapy, you're right. I think it's a liberating experience when people say, oh my God. Yeah. I mean, you can see the light bulbs come on. It's mm -hmm. like, first of all, the light bulb is I'm not alone. Right. There's mil there's yeah. millions of us out there mm -hmm. who feel the way I do. And second, it's it's not all in my head. Right. Yeah. I'm depressed for a reason. I'm and addicted a, for a reason. And a good reason. And a I can get reason. and I can get out of this with all those others. That's the basic principle of the most successful social program in the United States, 12 steps. That by joining AA, NA, whatever A you join those of us who have suffered can help one another and reach out to one another because we are the exactly. power to change. Exactly. It's very exactly. socialistic. And it's also that basic principle, which is behind the most successful transformative movement in the United States that is exists in every little town. There's an AA. So we as psychotherapists, I think, focusing on that piece again, I, th I think people like us, and we're not alone either. There, no. are, there are others of us out there mm -hmm. who realize that it's not just in our heads. But we have to speak up because the dominant institutions of the mental health care industry is what is in control right now mm -hmm. in terms of mental health care. And it does still preach the doctrine of individual responsibility. And what I say toward the beginning of my book is that much, much of the training and theories that underlie psychotherapy today, the dominant ones at least, are sophisticated exercises in blaming the victim. Absolutely. Now, that's not how they think of themselves. They didn't get into therapy to hurt people. But yet this is what we're being trained into is this viewpoint. I think so, so too. In I... 1980 is when DSM-3 came out, you mm -hmm. may recall. And um, I don't recall when you were born, Max. Were you born in 1980? <laughs> uh, 80, 85. Uh, there you so, go. So, 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 so I, would, I think when years. I was born, when I was born, I think homosexuality was still a mental disorder in the DSM-3, correct? Uh, the original I DSM think. three. Yeah, I think I think it was. I thought the three. Yeah. So anyway, so DSM three came out in 1980, and this was the first um, edition of the DSM that had major depression as its own separate diagnostic category. All the versions of the DSM prior to that 
depression was a symptom feature of some other diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So major depression became its own diagnosis. And shortly after that, Prozac appeared on the scene. It was the greatest marketing success of all time. Now, first of all, don't hear me saying that I'm against any of my patients taking psychoactive drugs. I, I'm, a, I'm a pragmatist. If it helps people, I want, I want them to have that available to them. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about is a doctrinaire position that depression is caused by chemical imbalances in the brain or by some neurocircuitry in the brain. So in 1980, after Ronald Reagan was elected, you know, we forget that there was a very healthy movement called community psychiatry mm. or social psychiatry mm. prior to 1980. And community psychology was a big thing. It wasn't the dominant view, but it was strong. In 1980, when Reagan was elected, it, it was only a few months after his election that a memorandum went out to the National Institutes of Health that said, we will no longer fund any research about the social origins of mental health problems. Wow. That actually happened. That was said. It was in a memorandum. And we've been there ever since, folks. Mm -hmm. we're, still, we're still putting the brain under a microscope and trying to understand where mental distress comes from in the brain. Yeah. You know, we I, don't I understand actually... that brains live, in a, brains live in a system of brains, you know. Well, there's, you know, one one thing I like about the this newer thing called interpersonal neurobiology is that they this term they have like the social synapse between brains that like brains yes. are co-regulating each other. And so in my training, so I'm I'm way more fresh out of a training program than you guys are. Like I finished about mm -hmm. five years ago. So, mm -hmm. you know, I so you are correct. I'd say in that, you know, the behaviorism, the sort of CBTism, uh, like that is the zeitgeist of modern therapy, you're expected to go into community mental health and whatever and have 5 million client caseload and not be able to help anybody because <laughs> you're burnt out and everything. Yeah. Um, and you're supposed to just like teach people how to like correct their incorrect thoughts and all that kind of stupid stuff. Um, but we, you know, we did actually have some professors and some courses that would emphasize the, the connectivity piece, thank God. Um, and, and like some somatic training and stuff there, you know, there's some cool stuff kind of still going on. I feel like it is definitely in the minority. Um, but I was going to say, Something that I run into somewhat often, uh, there's a, a teen client who I'm, I've been actually seeing for years now who um, is, is they're constantly looking for like the answer to the question, what's wrong with me? Mm -hmm. And it, it, I mean, it's like, it's like depressing for me sometimes to even keep hope because I'm like, man, you know, I've been working on this for a long time and like, it's not, that's not what it's about. Mm -hmm. Like that whole framework of thinking is actually more the problem than anything else. Um you know, there's, you have a personal history, there are contexts you're in, there's a certain level of trauma and a certain, you know, you can, you can kind of get your nervous system locked into a certain, I think, position from high saturation of childhood trauma that really can pre predispose you to things like much higher uh, sensitivity and reactivity and slower return to baseline. That's sort of a, you know, a conceptualization of uh, borderline that we, we kind of use in DBT. Mm -hmm. Um but that's all still happening in a enormously complex social context. Right. And we're very much, it's not like we're not allowed to, or not supposed to talk about that context with people, but the treatment isn't supposed to go there necessarily. There are some modalities I think that are more, um, <clears throat> for what they're called. They're, they're ones that I didn't get any training in. There's like, there's one with the word cultural in it. <laughs> there's, um, there are some like more systems, focused ones and and with uh don is it belkin uh, martinez yeah i think was her name yes mm -hmm. uh that that model the liberation health model really excites mm -hmm. me and I, mm -hmm. i've been meaning mm -hmm. to jump into one of their consultation calls and start conceptualizing cases through that but you know i keep seeing it there's even a fam i'll just one another quick like sort of case example so there's a family i recently took on where it's like yada yada the daughter's depressed help us with the daughter and also, thankfully, we did get some degree of like family systems training in my mm -hmm. program. So mm -hmm. I sort of I try to sort of embody like minutiae a little bit when this stuff comes up. And I'm like, let's see if if we're willing to look from a family systems lens. Let me see if I can talk to each family member, get them into different dyads, have this person present or absent from the room, start really tapping into the, the dynamics within the family 
as a way to assess and treat the so-called depression within an individual, like that stuff really excites me because mm-hmm. right. I, you know, I'd imagine you guys have a similar, you yeah. know, systemic, you, you know, you can see, yeah. Like you can start to see, it's not like, it's not like, Oh, like the wife has depression and the guy has a drinking problem or whatever. It's not actually, <laughs> it's, well, what's happening in the relationship, what's happening in their lives. It's happening in their personal history. What's, mm-hmm. you know, was the, was the history of redlining from 80 years ago, impacting the home ownership that's impacting the amount of rent that you're paying. You know, th- mm-hmm. these are actually all hugely significant factors in the here and now so-called mental right. health symptoms. But the, I think one challenge I run into, I don't know about you guys to, to close off this rant is <laughs> sometimes I receive people who are also floating around in the neoliberal religion who come to me with the neoliberal religion saying here, the way they are conceptualizing their own problems, I'm, I'm seeing as, oh God, like that's not, you know, I'm sorry, like I can't collude with you on even narrating the problem that way. <laughs> and sometimes it's right. just trying to re, uh, like re-narrate what's going on because mm-hmm. it's like, no, that's bullshit. It's not that there's something wrong with you or it's, mm-hmm. and often it's not that it's, there's something wrong with that individual in your life either, which is sometimes really difficult. It's mm-hmm. not that that person's a bad guy. That's actually not how it works either, you know? Um, I mean, sometimes, yes, that, yeah. that individual is is oppressive or abusive or mm-hmm. oh, whatever, yeah. but in a, in a really more a systemic and sort of connectivity focused lens. Um, well, I, I'll just say, lastly, that lens is very hard to shift. Like if you think of them as glasses for me to take off that lens and put them on someone else's head, I just find extraordinarily difficult sometimes. It's you know, a paradigm it's hard shift, to get them right? There. It's well, yeah, you know, really hard. <clears throat> part of it is, you know, I think without being a total conspiracy theorist, Joel Covell <laughs> presented a wonderful paper showing how the original DSM and those thereafter were sponsored by the drug companies who paid for those conventions. And they were sponsored in order to plug the diagnoses mm-hmm. into medications so much that the National Institutes of Mental Health have warned practitioners against something with no origin, a problem that has no origin but is just chemical. There's also one of the things we can be grateful for in recent brain science, (coughs) excuse me, and chemistry is that every emotion, every experience has a biochemical component, which is always changing. So there's always a biochemical adjustment to the to the society, which changes as you make a different adjustment. And so kind of making um, some kind of a ridiculous, isolated aspect of you that you have a chemical imbalance, well, you have an emotional imbalance, and Mm -hmm. we can change that. That there is this isolation and adoration of biochemical changes as if they don't come from somewhere and can't be changed and are in a context so that right. I, I think would, we have to do that. I, I appreciate both of you stepping into nuance what I said about brain research. I, I, mm-hmm. I actually am very fascinated by uh, current neuropsychology and I, I agree with where both of you are headed with this discussion. You know, we are, I, I spoke of soul earlier. Well, I think of soul and as not different from the body. We are embodied souls. So when something happens to us, of course, our brain chemistry changes. Yes, of course. Of course, our brain chemistry is affected. And Louis Cozzolino, you may be familiar with his work, has famously said the brain is a social organ. Right. There's no such thing as, he he literally wrote, there's no such thing as an individual brain. Maybe as a closeout, maybe if you just have any kind of final comments or any, um, like your book or articles or resources you might want to share with anyone sure. that wants to get to know your work better, your perspective. Good idea. I think one thing I haven't, I think one thing I have not said about myself while we're discussing psychotherapy is that my, uh, in terms of psychology and psychotherapy training, all my training was psychodynamic. So mm-hmm. um, all of my supervisors were psychodynamically trained. One of my supervisors was a psychoanalyst. And uh, one, one thing we tend to forget In the United States, we think of psychoanalysis as backward. We think of it as individualistic. Uh, We make jokes about it on Saturday Night Live and so forth. But uh, 
Yeah, psychoanalysis became very Americanized mm-hmm. once it came to our shores and did not represent its own roots uh, as it emerged in Europe. And there is a wonderful book that I highly recommend for those therapists who are interested in the history of therapy uh, by a historian who teaches at UCLA. Uh, you may have heard of him, Russell Jacoby. Oh, yeah. He wrote the book, The Repression of Psychoanalysis. Yeah, I read uh, that book. Yeah, the subtitle yeah. is Otto Finischel and the Political Freudians. Yeah. And he reminds us that... Um, in the Berlin Clinic, which actually was established before the Vienna Clinic was, uh, all the members of the Berlin Clinic were socialists and communists. And they all believed that neuroses, what, what they then call neuroses, that's antiquated language today, uh, but that the psychological distress they were trying to address was socially rooted. So what we're working on here today, when we say that it's not just in your head, mm-hmm. this is not a new idea. We're, right. we're resurrecting something that's in our roots as psychotherapists, but it, it's gotten pounded out of us by a sort of hyper-capitalistic culture mm-hmm. that wants to say that everything originates inside of individuals. And can be drugs. Mm-hmm. We can sell you a drug for it too. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Big pharma. I mm-hmm. mean, all of this has, be, has been monetized, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> Everything's been monetized. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So th- I didn't mention that part of my background. So there's a, there's a marriage here between um, a sort of um, reclaiming of the roots. The reason I like the word radical, I have a personal website that's coming out, by the way, probably this weekend. It's coming online. Mm-hmm. I think it's just brucerogersvon.com. And I say on that website that I'm an advocate of radical care. I love the word radical. Uh, unfortunately, and in, in the media in the United States, the word radical has gotten a bad rap. Mm-hmm. So, we speak, for example, of of some Muslim young person as being radicalized, mm. and that's a bad thing. But the word radical really means, if you take it apart etymologically, it means to get to the root of something, to get its to get at its root. And I think that's what we as therapists are trying to do, is get to the root of things. What the two of you and I are saying is the root of personal and interpersonal distress is not just in the head. Does it involve the head? Of course it does because we're whole people. Mm -hmm. So our brains are involved. Sure. Our body chemistry is involved. Absolutely. But our brains exist in an environment that is interpersonal and social. That's how our brains come to be and how they function. So, Psychotherapists have potentially an exceedingly important role to play in helping people cope with the injustices that are all around us Mm. every day. But psychotherapy does not exist in a vacuum, and it must itself exist with other forms of what I call soul care. Soul care also takes the form of activism and union work and political work. You know, we're all trying to make the world a better place that is habitable by human beings and by our fellow creatures. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, right? Much sense. It certainly does. And I think we're psychologically healthier and we're interpersonally healthier when we accomplish that kind of vision and realize that uh, if one of us suffers, we all suffer. Yeah, and there is... What it boils down to is connection is so desperately needed. And that's probably what Trump offers the isolated, sad, and dispossessed people who vote for him, a connection to something bigger that makes them someone. It's, it's, not, diff, it's not that different from the formation of gangs, mm-hmm. right? Gangs can be very destructive. Um, but people need to feel a part of something. That's right. And they're, de- they're desperate to feel part of something. 
Mm-hmm. And if we don't create a something that is just and good for people to be part of, they'll find something else to be part of. Yeah, whatever they can, wherever they can. We're social animals. Mm-hmm. Well, which is also why this is yet another rabbit hole. But when you talk about coming from kind of the, you know, poor, like white Appalachia, like that whole world, I think one big danger of the sort of neoliberal you know, the, the liberal milieu in uh, talking about um, uh, race relations in, in certain ways, it depends on where you're hearing race relations talk, but is that if, I, I think one of the big reasons that the alt-right has had its moment uh, and maybe continuing to have its moment in various ways is um, not, not figuring out where uh, lonely, angry white men can go Mm -hmm. uh right because if if white supremacists are saying well we have a great idea for you guys right you know (laughs) you here's a sense of belonging if that's what you need Mm -hmm. uh Mm -hmm. again a whole other rabbit hole i mean i don't know i might even just edit that out it's sort of tangential um but but just this question of like how do you yeah yeah, just how do you how do you create spaces for folk you know if the alternatives are actually destructive and damaging and and violent and if you don't have alternatives to that you know what can we really expect right whether it's gangs whether it's uh white supremacist right. groups what right. have you you know because right. you we don't need to be apart we do and <clears throat> that's part of the tragedy of not having a unified left with its own music and its own possibilities because yeah. there's a spiritual essential element to connecting with a bigger purpose together and that's uh, sadly absent these days. I, I guess the, the part of our political scene that I'm angriest with is probably not Trumpism. I think the part of our political scene I'm angriest with is what Nancy Fraser calls progressive liberalism mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and especially white liberals. So white liberals, and so I'm going to, do a terrible thing here and psychologize political behavior. (laughs) But um, white liberals love to uh, project their racism onto uh, Appalachia. Yes. And onto working class whites. And it's those whites that are the problems. Right. You know, after Trump was elected, you may remember this bestseller came out, uh, Hillbilly Elegy. Yes, uh, I do. Vance. Uh-huh. Yes, I do. I, I picked it up. I thought I, I heard him interviewed on National Public Radio, and I thought, well, I'll pick up this book and check it out. I got two chapters into it and threw it down. Mm-hmm. I, I, it, I did not recognize the people he was writing about. You know, it, it was full of stereotypes of people in Appalachia's gun toting, uh, tobacco spitting, shoot yeah. em up, addicts, you know good for nothing trailer trash basically and mm-hmm. are there some of those people in Appalachia of course sure. there are but but Appalachia is not distinctive in that regard mm-hmm. and most people I grew up with in Appalachia were caring people mm-hmm. um, and uh, were there was there racism there of course but I don't think there was any more racism there than there was in the boardroom of General Electric right. <laughs> Or, or for that matter, in the boardroom of, of uh, Harvard University. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So we've just got to stop this shit about yeah. projecting mm-hmm. all of our racist tendencies and thoughts onto certain, uh, you Groups. know, the quote, white working glass and so forth. Mm-hmm. And also, you know, I, there is an author that's wonderful called Joe Bagent, B-A-G-E-A-N-T, mm-hmm. who I does. I think I have his book. Yeah, he has two books. One is... Deer Hunting with Jesus. That's one of them. And the other is <laughs> Rainbow Pie. And they're both... I haven't seen that one. Okay. And they're both about the people he grew up with in Virginia. And he talks about them and himself with soul. They're not stereotypes. Even though he's afraid at some of the currents that are going on, he's not as stereotyping. A, as I, yeah. yeah, as we all are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but he sees them as people and not as stereotypes that 
against which we can feel high and mighty in our progressive neoliberalism, as you so aptly well, said. I'm thinking out loud as you all are, but I wonder if as therapists, part of our social responsibility is no one is more familiar intimately with human suffering than psychotherapists. Mm -hmm. mm. True. And, and in my book yes. <laughs> and in my book and in a number of articles I've written, I've said that part of what I feel I have a responsibility to, to do is to help, to help people who are suffering, find their voices. Mm -hmm. What is their pain trying to say? Yeah. What is their depression trying to say? To them, yes, but maybe to the, to us, mm -hmm. to the world. So that's that's absent from much of our politics today. It is. It's absent not only from our politics, but from the mental health professional's dominant voice. Oh my gosh, you're going to make me cry. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's so true. Mm. And that's what we're trying to reintroduce as part of a whole movement away from social responsibility and social engagement and social connection mm -hmm. back to those mm -hmm. things which we need and that connectivity with other people. In a sense, we're talking about, Harriet, I think, bringing the humanity back into psychotherapy. That's right. You know, and moving it away from being technicians. Technicians of a biological phenomenon, which is not a psychobiological, a social psychobiological, but some kind of a biological person. And in my mm -hmm. long experience, part of the reason that everybody gets better who sticks with it is because they feel my love for them. And if they didn't, they wouldn't get better. Yes, they feel right. I care. They know I care. And having another human being listen and care is as healing as graduate degrees by a long shot. It's more healing. I saw a woman years ago whom I will never forget who had a, I won't, of course, do the whole case here on this podcast, but she had a very tragic history and understandably was distrustful of people. She was especially distrustful of people if they seemed to care for her. Yeah. So I was in a pickle as her therapist who was trying to care for her. So we lived in this tension of her suspiciousness of my care. And uh, I forget what she said one day, but she said some broad, expansive statement about uh, nobody is ever there for her or not, nobody wants to nobody wants to understand her. And I just spontaneously and really unthinkingly said, uh, I want to understand you. I just said it matter of fact. Uh -huh. And she, she made eye contact with me for the first time in the session. And here's what she said. Yes, but I pay you. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I was back on my heels. And then the words just mm -hmm. came to me. I said, and the words were true. I told her the truth. I said, yes, you do. You pay me for my time, but you cannot pay me for my care. That's beautiful. That's yeah. right. Yeah. My care for you is, is from me. It's genuine. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was not a miraculous cure moment, but it was kind of a turning point in the therapy. So um, we learn things is what I'm saying in our engagements with people suffering and with our own suffering, you know, I don't have to tell the two of you that we take on a lot of vicarious suffering ourselves yeah. by sitting with people in pain. And we don't need to forget that because it can be costly to be a therapist. Mm -hmm. So we need to have communities around us who care for us. Right. Um, but at any rate, um, we, we need to remind people and who are in political action and social action and activism that uh, we've got to pay attention to people's pain. Their pain has to have a voice. I, I think this is one of the successes of black lives matter. Mm. Yes. Uh, black lives matter is basically a movement of grief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's so grief. Is, and so is me too. Movement. Black and lives so matter. And so is me too. Me too. And time's me up. Me too is another great example. Time's up. 
but we need those kinds of move social movements that bring individual and interpersonal suffering into a social voice. Mm -hmm. And uh, therapists, I think, have a responsibility to be part of that. Yes, absolutely. I, this could be another rabbit hole, Bruce, but, um, and I, I feel like I'm, well, I've, I actually had a rough night and I'm like, oh, is that, okay. It'll come back. I I had a rough glitch, but it's back. Okay. I had like a rough night and I've like almost cried like five times today. And I feel like this conversation is like almost putting me on the edge of crying. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so when we talk about people in pain, I, so when I was in my training program, I hit a point where I decided I wanted to work with perpetrators of, uh, various forms of violence, Mm. mainly because of my own upbringing and sort of my issues with my dad having been a, you know, domestically abusive kind of guy. And I think I had this sort of, uh, a sort of idealism around like, well, you know, if you, if you heal the harmers, mm. yada, 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 you know, the sort of theory of change, you got to heal the harmers. Um, and also over the years, I think only realizing in retrospect that I had caused harm to a lot of people in my life mm-hmm. um, in varying ways. You know, I'm not, I'm not like coming out as a serial killer or anything, but like, <laughs> you know, and, it, and, and I think that also is human nature as well. It's something that doesn't, so it's an important conversation. I don't think we have enough. Like we we do talk a lot about like those who are in pain and who are victims and have been harmed. We don't talk. I think we don't talk enough about those who do harm and yeah. what to do about that. Uh, and th- this is a huge rabbit hole that can go into mass incarceration and punitive and carceral versus say, you know, restorative and transformative justice. Um, and the huge difficulties there. Uh, but it's something that I've been, I'm still wrestling with. It's been many years in trying to figure out that sweet spot because I did end up, I sort of made the juvenile sex offender team leader at the nonprofit I worked at for like five years, just actually the old, the other person quit. And I just, I was on the team and they like made me the Mm -hmm. team leader, which means more responsibilities, but they don't give you a raise and stuff. So, you know, I took on all these like teenage guys that, you know, sometimes you get the police reports, you read through it. Some, some of it was like, Oh, you idiot. Like, why did you do that? Other times it was like, I don't, I'm not going to sleep at night. Like reading about this, you know, whether it's child molestation or whatever, like Mm -hmm. stuff that's just kind of sickening. And, and then, and then having to wrestle constantly doing consultation and venting and, and whatever, but it's still on my mind all the time. Right. Like, because it's also this question when we talk about community and connectivity, the issue of conflict, which is just so inevitable, right? In mm-hmm. marriages, couples, housemate relationships, worker cooperatives, workplaces, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, this might sound tangential, but it's it's at the crux of a lot of my thinking these days. And how do we conceptualize harm and harmers uh, with and and hold that with like a healing orientation if that makes sense mm-hmm, mm-hmm. well they're people or, you know yes. yes you have to remember they're people they're hurt people themselves you know i had a client right. who was a therapist for recently released offenders every single one of them had been sexually abused every yeah. one of them yeah so so often uh, this kind of behavior emerges from pain yeah. right from trauma and we tend to forget this. And this, mm-hmm. this is one of the places where as a therapist, I reach into my, the marrow of my bones, which, which is formed in a r- rural religious community <laughs> of a Christian mm-hmm. type that believe deeply in repentance and forgiveness. Mm-hmm. And uh, I try not to forget that but we have a system of incarceration that doesn't believe in repentance and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. We we don't really believe it's possible. And, and even if we did believe it, we couldn't monetize it. So we would work against it. Mm -hmm. You know, we make too much money putting people in prison. mm -hmm. Well, I think, so there's that on the, in the big systemic sense. And I think even now, you know, from call out culture to now what's been called cancel culture and all this, you know, something that I think, you know, liberals have gotten really good at, whether it's uh, narrating the poor Appalachian whites as the bad guys, or, you know, whoever it is, if it's a sort of dominant identity group, that 
this sort of vengeful mentality as well, right? Like, well, mm -hmm. so okay, here's a sort of demographic group of harmers. So let's right. have uh, usually, I mean, it's a sort of online theater at this point, but <laughs> let's have a sort of enormously, like it seems very activisty from some, from one standpoint, um, from an from a neoliberal attention economy analysis, it's a totally different mm -hmm. thing. But mm -hmm. the phenomenon becomes this: let's sort of um, let's mob together to attack the harmers as vengeance for justice, which some mm -hmm. celebrate still and say, well, yeah, there you go. You got them. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think really when you're sort of, when you're on the ground, like seeing the impacts of what this does often, oh my God. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't actually result in justice. It doesn't no, resolve it doesn't. conflicts. It doesn't um, create healing for those who are acting out of vengeance, you know, and so on and so on. And I think, yeah. you know, there are cases like with the Breon Taylor um, news that just came out. I mean, I think every single time there's like another Molotov cocktail thrown when a killer cop gets off. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I so, I mean, I personally, I always feel a sense of relief, like, thank God they're fighting back right. and that we're mm -hmm. fighting back, mm -hmm. which I do think is, is, is different. Um, but I do feel very concerned still looking at okay, so there's the harmer. We found the bad guy. Let's get him. Um, it's, yeah, it just, I, I'm like constantly very concerned about this. <laughs> yeah, Max, it sounds like uh, your background and your youth was not terribly different from mine as far as religion is concerned. So I, I went into, um, I was one of the first in my extended family to go to college, much less graduate school. Well, I knew growing up that fundamentalist Baptists could be mean as snakes, but I didn't know liberals could be mean as, mean as snakes until I became yeah. among them, mm. but they can yeah. be right. It, so fundamentalist Christians don't have the corner on that market. No, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. So we all need to be, uh, watching ourselves and, um, trying to stay with the angels, the better angels of our nature and not with our, just our seeking for vengeance per se. And also joining with the angelic movements that are trying to transform us and each Absolutely. other. Because Absolutely. we can't be angels by ourselves. No, not at all. I'm probably at a moment where I have to begin transitioning and Me getting too. ready to go to the office, but I could talk with you guys like for days. Yeah. It's been wonderful. Um, I know. Yeah. I, I, I knew when I got with you, I would feel I was, I was among soul, soul friends. So. Yes. I feel I the feel. same way. It, thank you so much for doing this with yeah. us. Thank, thank I, you. Bruce. I will and... plug my book is caring for souls in a neoliberal age mm -hmm. where, where, where books are sold as we say. <laughs> it's out there. Okay. And as I said, my website will be coming online this weekend. So if for those who are hearing this podcast, go to BruceRogersVon.com if you want to see more about what I'm doing in my neck of the woods. That sounds great. And thank you guys for what you're doing in yours. I will certainly be your allies. By the way, listeners, if you have enjoyed anything you've heard Harriet say in this program, you will definitely enjoy Capitalism Hits Home, which is a solo program that Harriet does through Democracy at Work, which is a worker-owned cooperative that produces other great programs such as Economic Update with Richard Wolf and the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles with David Harvey. I can't recommend enough that everyone also listen to Capitalism Hits Home if you enjoy It's Not Just in Your Head. Capitalism Hits Home is a sort of broader over overhead view. It explores the way that capitalism shapes our personal lives, our psyches, our relationships, our families, and it looks particularly at the sea change in American personal life as all Americans but the top 10 or 20 percent of Americans have our security and our chance for a future become as precarious as it always was for minorities and families headed by women. It's not just in your head and capitalism hits home are definitely complementary. And if listeners would like to check out Capitalism Hits Home, Harriet, where should they go to find it? Either on YouTube or Democracy at Work or on my own website, harrietfraud.com.